speaker, um, Dr. Jeffrey Cole, you saw in the video just earlier um, in the intro session. Um, he's with the Center of the Digital Future at uh, the University of Southern California, Annenberg School of Communication. And uh, I think we're, uh, the title of the session is Content Platforms and the Future of Consumption. So Dr. Cole, welcome. Big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Incidentally, only my mother calls me Dr. Cole, just Jeff. I am delighted to be here. I have always been a big fan of what Rick did with the iMedia summits, and to be part of this is really exciting. I think the content will live up to your expectations. I'll do my best to make sure it does. But I can tell you after the dinner and reception last night, it's already the best food I've ever seen at any conference. So I think we're off to a good start. Anyway, I've spent the last 13 years tracking digital use. I'm a television guy. I love television. I've worked in television in production. I've worked with the four networks under an antitrust waiver. I adore television. Please remember that as I look at some of the disruptions. And I was always taught that we lost the opportunity to understand the impact of television that what we should have done but didn't is we should have tracked people before they had television and then gone back to them year after year as they acquired and used it to see how it changed their lives. 13 years ago, I became convinced that digital, first the web and now mobile, was going to be far more powerful than television. So believing that we lost a great opportunity with television, and that digital was going to be even more important than television, in the year 2000, we started this massive project, this tracking of digital that we thought should have been conducted of television. We started in the US, and now we're in 36 countries around the world. We just added, actually, last week, the Republic of Georgia. So that's where some of my data, some of my insights come from. And when we started in the year 2000, one of the first things we saw, which made a lot of my friends at the networks uncomfortable and unhappy, was more than from any other place, the time for the internet was coming from television. Now, this isn't a big surprise. For all of our lives, television has dominated our at-home awake time. Most of us, as soon as we enter the home, turn on the television set, we leave it on till we go to sleep. Some of us go to sleep with it on. Some of us leave it on when we're not at home so that people think we are at home. So if we were going to carve out time at home to do anything, take a walk, take a nap, take a shower, the time almost had to come from television. But then four years later, around 2004, we found that wasn't the whole story, that the time for, for the internet was coming from television. It turns out it wasn't the internet that was a threat to television. It was dial-up, that the act of dialing up, when people would go online two or three times a day, 20 to 40 minutes at a time, frequently in a back bedroom or an office, that was time families spent not talking to each other, although somebody could wander into the back office and talk to you. And it was generally time spent not watching television, although many people did have a television set next to the PC and were multitasking from the beginning. But what we found was wireless and broadband were the best friends television ever had. And we've seen since 2004 and especially, we think, over the next decade, that television is the only mass medium that doesn't shrink. We think all media survive. We think theatrical film will be here in 10, 20 years. We think the music business will survive. We think newspapers, which I also love, will survive. But we think they'll all be smaller businesses in a digital era. The exception is television, which we think will explode with growth be bigger than it's ever been, escape from the home, and become our constant companion. As Rick pointed out in the intro, we should coin a new term instead of television. To most people, television means the set in the home on a schedule, 
And all television means today is audio and video. And YouTube and Hulu are as much television as ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, or ESPN. And even though we should coin a new term, we're not going to. So we're stuck with this term, which actually meant one thing and now means all things. But our work has shown conclusively for about five years now, and I don't use words like conclusively very often, that people will watch television on a small screen in their pocket or purse. Not just two or three minute sports clips or news packages or movie trailers, but 30, 60, 90 minute shows. Sometimes we'll watch a 30 minute show straight through if we're stuck at the airport waiting for a flight. Sometimes we'll watch a 30 minute show in eight or nine or 10 parts. Keep in mind that at the same time as we're putting these little screens in our pockets or purses, we're putting bigger and better screens in our homes than we've ever had before. The gap between the home and the theater has never been so narrow. The time gap has never been so short. And we will save our preferred content for the big screen. I gave a talk last year at the Cannes Lions Awards, and there was a Canadian in the audience, and he raised his hand and said, I'm a Canadian, and I'm a big hockey fan which is pretty redundant if you think about it. And he said, why would anybody watch a hockey game on a mobile phone? And the answer is, if you love hockey, you won't. You'll seek out the biggest and best screen you can find unless you can't get to the big screen, and it's more important to see it sooner rather than later. My partners and I, my partners in Europe, and three years ago, during the World Cup Finals, we interviewed people who had to work during the World Cup Finals. And given a choice between watching the World Cup Finals delayed on a big screen, and I think everybody knows how unsatisfying it is to watch sports after it's over, when people already tell you the score and you practically have to live in a sound vacuum to avoid finding out, but given a choice between watching it delayed on a big screen or live on a little screen, almost everybody chose live on a little screen. Nobody's going to watch Avatar or The Life of Pi for the first time on a mobile phone. But we may watch it for the second or third time on a mobile phone. And as we do, something truly revolutionary happens with television. It escapes from the home. Television never really existed outside the home until now. The exceptions, the hospital, if you're sick, that's your home. The bar, for some people, that's their home. But now we're going to be watching television at the airport, waiting for a flight, on the airplane itself, in the back seat of our cars, hopefully not the front seat while we're driving. And as we do, television becomes our constant companion. Who's our constant companion now? If you're stuck at the airport waiting for a flight, most of us don't pull out books or newspapers or magazines. We pull out our mobile phones and we start calling people. And it's only after someone answers do we figure out whether we really have anything we want to say to them. Television is going to become our constant companion. The thing we do, not just watching a two-hour movie at home, but watching in little dribs and drabs in between meetings when the airplane taxis from the gate, to, excuse me, taxis from the airline way to, to the gate, all these different places. In 1975, in the US, in the United States, we spent 16 hours a week in front of a screen. Last year, the number was up to 44 hours. More importantly, we think it'll be at 55 hours in the next three to five years. But forget the prediction for a minute. 44 hours last year, that's over a quarter of all human time. If you factor out sleep, that's about a third of all time. And we know that teenagers, that 80% of them sleep next to their mobile phones. The only time they're not in front of a mobile phone is when they're in school and when they are asleep. 
and I'm not so sure they're not in front of a phone when they're in school. They certainly are during lunch and recess. And if you ask them why do they sleep next to their mobile phones, they'll give you a very simple, straightforward answer, as most of you know who have kids. It's their alarm clock. We and a lot of other people learned 10, 12 years ago, teenagers weren't wearing watches. I made what I thought was a silly comment in 2002, and I guess it didn't turn out to be so silly. I said in 2002 that now the entire jewelry industry, not to mention the economy of Switzerland, is waiting to the answer to the question, will they start wearing watches as they get older? Well, we've been tracking them for 13 years. We have people who were 30 today who were 17 when we started. They're still not wearing watches. Incidentally, just a slight digression on that. Uh, in New York City, as most of you know, crime rates in New York City have gone down miraculously to historically low levels. But in January, Mayor Bloomberg reported that for the first time in 15 years, technically crime was up, but the singular explanation for crime going up was iPhone thefts. And one of my friends explained to me, I never thought about this, do you know how you steal an iPhone? You walk up to a teenager and you say, do you have the time? And then they reach in their pocket, take out their phone, look at the time, and essentially they're just handing it right there and saying, take it, although not literally. We're also seeing the ratings for live television events climb to records they've never seen before. Last year's Super Bowl, even though it was only 1 14th of size video, Last year's Super Bowl became the highest rated television program of all time. This year's Super Bowl just down a little bit. Last year's Super Bowl broke the record of the 2011 Super Bowl as the highest rated television program of all time. And that broke a 28 year record, which was the last episode of MASH in 1983. But it's not just the Super Bowl, we've seen the ratings for the Olympics, We've seen the ratings for the World Cup, and it's not just sports, it's been award shows. The ratings for live events continue to climb. And the reason for that is simple, co-viewing, watching television with other people. The difference is until now, to watch with other people, the other people had to be in the room with us. Now we're watching when the other people are anywhere, whether it's in the next bedroom, whether it's upstairs, or whether it's around the world. Watching through our mobile phones, our internet-enabled television sets, I actually believe the little crawl at the bottom of the screen that came into fashion after 9-11 to provide a supplemental news source, I think that's gonna be replaced very soon by a social networking crawl where you and your friends can plug in through your mobile phone or your internet-enabled television set how you're feeling about what you're watching, and we can see what our friends who aren't with us think as we watch live events together. I think one of the great killer apps that we're gonna see in the next two years that's either worth billions of dollars or is so simple it's probably gonna be free, and I think it's more likely the latter, is gonna be an app now that 50% of us have DVRs or TiVos that's gonna let five, 10, 20 of us record something, agree to watch it at a set time, and then as we all agree to watch it in our own homes or our own places, it will synchronize our DVRs so that what we watch will be as if it's live so we can share it with everybody else. Now one of the ways we do this, of course, one of the major ways is through tablets. And in the work I do, I think iPads are transformational. Invite me back in a year or two and I might amend that to tablets are transformational. But so far, we think it's iPads. Samsung, Hewlett Packard, Motorola, RIM have all had three years to try to catch up with Apple and the iPad, and none of them have. The only people who have caught up to Apple and the iPad are Apple themselves with the iPad 2, the iPad 3, even though they didn't call it that, and the unexpected delivery of the iPad 4 last fall. 
I have friends who work at Apple who say off the record, and at Apple you have to speak off the record, because if you ever spoke on the record, you could be killed, and that's only a slight exaggeration. They say that two years ago, in 2011, when they were getting ready to release the iPad 2, they were planning to drop the price by $150. But they looked around and they said, nobody's beating us on features. Nobody's beating us on price. Why bother? And they were right, because you can prove that. Because later in 2011, in the summer, Hewlett Packard introduced their touchpad. And they priced it exactly the same as the entry level iPad, $499 for 16 gigs. People looked at the touchpad and said, who cares? Realizing they had made a mistake, three weeks later, Hewlett Packard dropped the price by $100 to $399. People looked at the touchpad and again said, who cares? Then Hewlett Packard made this astonishing decision to close down their entire PC division, a decision they since have rethought, but they fired their CEO over it, and they dropped the price of the touchpad to $99. Finally, people cared. The problem for Hewlett Packard is it cost them $309 to make a touchpad. So the lesson is clear. You're willing to lose $210 per tablet, you've got a great business. And of course, how do you compensate for that, according to the old joke? Volume, volume, volume. So the iPad comes out, and my job is to look at this thing and say, is this the fourth screen, or does it replace the second screen? I think we all count screens the same way, and they were up on the screen itself a few minutes ago. But just to be sure, television's the first screen, the computer's the second screen, the smartphone's the third screen, Movie theater owners have been complaining for years now, hey, we're the fourth screen. Nobody takes that seriously, probably because you don't own or rent that screen. It's somebody else's screen. So the tablet, the iPad comes out. My job is to say, is this the fourth screen, or does it replace the second? We firmly believe it replaces the second. We think the PC is going away, ex we thought this now for four years, except for four to six percent of the population. The four to six percent who we think will continue to use PCs, heavy duty number crunchers, computer assisted designers, big writers, and maybe college students while they're in college. To the rest of us, a PC is a needlessly complex device takes too long to learn, takes five minutes to boot, and one out of every 20, 30 times encounters the blue screen of death. A tablet, on the other hand, you can learn instantly. You hand a tablet to a three-year-old boy or an 83-year-old grandmother, and within five minutes, both will be using it. The only difference is within five minutes, the three-year-old boy will be teaching you things you didn't know. It boots instantly, unlike a PC, which if you log off and you forgot to do something, you have to negotiate with yourself, is it important enough to reboot? You don't do that with a tablet, because a tablet you are back in literally in a second, and there's no blue screen of death. I don't know anyone who travels, which I'm sure describes all of you, who has a laptop and has a tablet who, when they're going on a trip, doesn't look at their laptop, and then look at their tablet, and then look back at their laptop and say, can I leave you at home? And what they're saying is, I want to leave you at home, but what do I have to do? Because there are still a couple things I don't want to do on the tablet. But keep in mind, the limitations of the tablet come not from the device. They came from the stubbornness of Steve Jobs. The refusal to have Adobe Flash, there's no reason an iPad can't have Adobe Flash. That was Jobs declaring war on Adobe, a war he won just before he passed away. The refusal to have a USB port, 
Jobs just wanted a walled garden. You could easily put a USB port. And Tim Cook has already gone over or done things Jobs didn't want, because Jobs used to make fun of the idea of a mini iPad. And then after he died, we saw a mini iPad. Walter Isaacson, Jobs' biographer, says that Jobs' fingerprints will be on everything that comes out of Apple for 24 months after his death. Well, we're now in month 18, which means the iPhone 5S, which we may see over the summer, will still be a Jobs innovation, but that will be near the end. And Apple's now being held to this standard of not just making great products, but making game-changing products. No one has come up with three game-changing products in 10 years. But now the fear is there, is there are no more. We'll see if there's one more that comes from Steve Jobs before October. Moving a little bit to the television environment and being a little more specific, we found in the work we did, unexpectedly, one of the most interesting environments to track, and we didn't know this when we started, was college students who had just graduated and were setting up their first apartments. And that's when they had to decide which things they grew up with they're willing to pay for and which things they weren't. And that's where we saw 12, 13 years ago, they weren't getting landline phones. And it was obvious what's happening to landline phones. That's where we also sadly saw they weren't subscribing to, to the newspaper. And it's clear what's happening to newspapers. Three years ago, we saw they also weren't establishing connections with cable and satellite TV. We're seeing not only cord cutting, but we're seeing never establishing cords. Nielsen reported two years ago, for the first time in the history of television, the number of households with television went down. Not by a lot, by less than 1%. And then last year, they went down again, also under 1%, for a total of about a 1 and 3 quarters percent. But the interesting thing is that's not lack of interest in television. That's lack of interest in television through conventional sources. We don't believe this is the beginning of the end of cable and satellite television. We have the highest penetration in the world at 91%. But we believe this is the beginning of the end of cable and satellite television priced the way it's been priced. Now, Jeff Bukas, Time Warner got nervous at these phenomena. And they got together and they created television everywhere. A great idea. They said to their customers, you want to watch Game of Thrones? You want to watch CNN? You want to watch any of this stuff on your iPad, your smartphone? your computer, you can watch it anywhere you want. Once you authenticate to us, you're spending $80 a month on cable television. But one of the very reasons people were going around was not just convenience, but was, was to not spend the $80 a month on television. And there's nothing Jeff Bukas can do for you there to avoid that. Uh, if you look at the future of television, you'll see it's changing in very, very dramatic ways. Um, we think, for example, that it's only a matter of time before one of the major cable, network, cable programming suppliers decides to go over the top. Now, HBO swears they will not be the ones to do it, although they're the logical ones to do it. But if you look back, before you look at something like HBO going over the top, if you look at the movie studios, they are chomping at the bit to release their movies day and date into the home. The only reason they don't do it is because the theater owners scream at them, if you do, we will make you pay. We won't carry your films. Last fall, Universal was releasing Tower Heist, and they were planning to release it into the home three weeks after it played in the theater. And that, of course, as most of you know, is a considerably shorter window. The general window is at least two months, and usually more like three or four. And the theater owners threatened Universal, if you do that, 
we will not show your movies. Now, it turned out Tower Heist wasn't the right movie to do that for, and they pulled it back. But the right movie is going to come, and if you think about it, not said with any happiness, the theater owners have no leverage here, because the minute Universal does do it, the theater owners say, we won't carry any Universal movies, and then Disney does it, and they say, we won't carry any Disney movies, and then Warner does it, and they say, we won't carry any Warner movies, then what business are they in? The same way HBO, I think they're the logical choice, is going to make a decision. They've come close to it with HBO Go, which is a phenomenal application. But I think what's a matter of time, they say no before they sell HBO directly to consumers. Right now, we pay $15 a month to the cable company. Half of that goes to HBO. Half of that goes to the cable company. HBO can sell directly to you. It does this now. It started doing it three months ago in the Nordic countries, but they didn't have cable companies and a legacy to offend back in the cable companies. But HBO can sell directly to the consumer, $11, $11.50. They decide. They make an extra $4. The consumer saves $2.50. And then the whole system breaks. Because something really interesting happened. I don't know how many of you followed this. Every year, several times a year, we now have these games of chicken between the cable companies or the satellite companies and the programs, program providers over license fees. The networks want more and more money out of license fees every time they renegotiate. The, cable, the programmers want more. And last fall, the most recent example of this was a game of chicken between Viacom and DirecTV. Viacom, of course, had Comedy Central and Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert, Nickelodeon, MTV, and they got into a fight with Direct, and Direct stopped carrying their programming. Now, normally, when that would, something like that would happen, the cable companies would swoop down put ads in the newspapers and say, dear DirecTV customers, you want all the programming you love, switch to cable. But this time, they supported their arch enemy, DirecTV. And the reason they supported their arch enemy is because they all know that every year, every cable programmer who's got programming people like are going to come back to them and demand more money, going to be at least 10% increases every year, none of which go to the cable company. And every time they raise rates, more people are going to cut the cords. We also have seen on the horizon, I don't think it'll survive ultimately through the courts, but Barry Diller's Aereo, which has survived two court challenges already. The networks call it theft. But Diller provides a service in New York where you can get just the broadcast networks and a few other local channels uh, through your internet connection. Last week, you may have seen Chase Carey threaten that if Aereo survives, they'll take the Fox network and take it off air. And keep in mind, they'd only lose 9% of their viewers and go directly uh, through cable systems. But I think going to cable is the wrong move at the moment. This is all going to break, and the big loser, the only one, the one who's going to lose the most, sadly, and this is not said with any happiness and with great respect to what Rob was saying before, but the biggest loser is ESPN. Because ESPN will never be able to replicate what it has now, which is 100 million households paying $5 a month or $6 billion a year plus advertising. ESPN is phenomenal. If you look back in the mid-90s, Viacom bought CBS for $5 billion. Disney bought ABC for $18 billion. And when, they, when Disney bought ABC, CBS was a better network. The difference between the $5 billion and the $18 billion was ESPN. ESPN clearly, as you could tell from Rob, has a phenomenal strategy with all of its other platforms.
but its ability to collect a half a billion dollars a month, we think is coming to an end. So as you look at the, I could talk about all this stuff forever, as you could probably tell, but as you look at this entire universe of programming, never has there been so much good programming and never has there been so much bad programming on television at the same time. But we really are living in the era that we've heard for the last 20 years that content is king. But I would argue in this decade and beyond, if content has been king, then in the future, pardon the deliberately inappropriate grammar, but in the future, content is kinger. It has never been more important, and that's all that matters. The delivery system is irrelevant. I appreciate your time. I will be around for the next two days. Anyone who doesn't like what I said or wants to challenge me or just get more information, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very, very much. Big round of applause for Jeff Cole. Thank you. Uh, I've seen him speak several times. Always very, very interesting.